Welcome everyone, this is Roger Fisk. I'm the Director of Communications for the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. Thank you so much for joining us for episode nine of the Sea, sea Shepherd Show uh, with our extra, extra special guest, Captain Paul Watson here on World Oceans Day 2022. We're gonna let the room fill up, but thank you so much for joining us and we're gonna start in just one or two moments. Thank you. For those of you just joining us, thank you so much for um, choosing to spend some time with us on your on your World Oceans Day here in 2022. You've joined us for episode nine of the Sea Shepherd Show um, with our extra special guest tonight, Captain Paul Watson. We're gonna continue to let the room fill up for a moment. I see some of our chapters coming online. I see superstar volunteer Lakin Arnold there. Lakin, we can't do a show without you, so thanks for coming in early. Um, maybe some of the chapters could give me a little shout out as the, in the chat as they join us. Cleveland, of course, Cleveland coming in strong and early as always. Wisconsin, Vancouver Island, thanks so much. North Cal, Phoenix, Arizona, Seattle. Uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, thank you so much for joining us. New York City. And Brazil, we've got some Brazil content for you in our show tonight. San Diego, Germany, uh, from Julie up in New England, thanks so much. New Zealand even, uh, Northern Virginia. Okay, um, my name is Roger Fisk. I am the Director of Communication for the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. And our room is still filling up, but we're gonna get started. Um, Captain Paul Watson, our special guest for tonight. Uh, if you could join us, that would be great. Welcome, Bozeman, Montana. Well, welcome, Brazil. Um, it is World Oceans Day 2022. You've been doing this for decades, Paul. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. And I guess I want to just start with kind of like the broadest possible view on things. It's World Oceans Day. What should people be should be concerned about the state of the oceans? And what are two, what are one or two causes for optimisms about the state of the ocean here in 2022? Well, thanks to everybody for joining today on World Ocean Day. And uh, where do I begin on what Sea Shepherd's doing? We're operating a global operation here. Uh, we're doing campaigns uh, in the waters off of uh, Africa, in the Mediterranean, uh, in the Sea of Cortez. Uh, in the Southern Ocean and in the Baltic. And uh, Sea Shepherd is a worldwide movement now and uh, addressing very uh, important issues uh, around the planet, uh, concentrating on the over-exploitation of, uh, of the fishes um, and also very much concerned about other things like pollution, acidification, and the effects of climate change on marine ecosystems. One of the things that I'm actually most uh, concerned about is the uh, is to try and get people to understand the situation in the sea. Uh, since 1950, there's been a 40% uh, diminishment in phytoplankton populations, uh, and what that what that means is that phytoplankton provides up to 70% of the oxygen in the air we breathe and sequesters enormous amounts of uh, of CO2. And uh, the reality is, is that if phytoplankton disappears, we don't survive. We don't live on a planet uh, where there is no phytoplankton. We're, basically, we would be able to breathe. <laughs> it really comes right down to that, which really underlines what I say all the time, if the ocean dies, uh, we all die. And one of the reasons for the uh, diminishment of phytoplankton has been the uh, diminishment over the last century of uh, of whales and seals, seabirds and fishes, because these species provide the nutrient base for the phytoplankton, the uh, primarily iron and uh, nitrogen, magnesium, uh, and these nutrients are essential for a healthy phytoplankton population. To give you an example, uh, one blue whale every day uh, defecates about three tons of manure into the, into the ocean. And, that's very, very rich in those nutrients. So farmers in many, uh, whales are many, in many sense, uh, the farmers of the ocean and their crop is phytoplankton and which is the basis for, for life on, on this planet. So I, I'm always trying to get people to understand just how important that is. And the 
the real problem here is over exploitation, both legally and Ill illegally. But as the resources become scarcer, that motivates more illegal operations. And that's where Sea Shepherd has been stepping in with partnerships with various nations uh, around the world where they lend us the authority and we provide the resources and we're able to intervene. And I think we've uh, stopped about 78 poaching operations in the last year and a half. One of the other projects that we're very much concerned about is the protection of the Piquita porpoise in the um, Sea of Cortez. And uh, I'm quite confident that since 2015, if we had not been there every year since, and we're there right now, that the, the Bikita would now be extinct. And that uh, is a success story, and I'm hoping that we can keep it up. We just have to buy time uh, in order for the uh, numbers to, uh, to be uh, come up, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to see a success story, similar to you know the protection of the California condor or the whooping crane, and that we can bring these we can bring these species back from from the brink, uh, but it takes a lot of effort to to do so. And of course, uh, we're able to do this because of the uh, incredible support from uh, our support base uh, around the world. It's uh, the, you know the contributions both uh, financially and also uh, with people's physically getting involved on the ships or, or in the chapters or you know, as support groups and everything makes an incredible difference in, in uh, financing the operations uh, of, the, of these ships. We uh, are also very much involved with removing uh, marine debris from the, from the sea. Um, we took uh, tons and tons of marine debris off of Cocos Keeling Island in Indian Ocean, cleaned up turtle beaches in um, Northern Australia. We have a crew right now in the island of Mayotte, which is uh, protecting uh, sea turtles from uh, poachers. Mayotte's a little island between Madagascar and Mozambique. And uh, we have two vessels in the Mediterranean now, which are confiscating fish aggregating devices, which are being illegally set in the Mediterranean. And uh, we've conf confiscated hundreds of them. And so we're really making a difference and we're making that difference because of the, the support that all of you are, are giving to us each and, and every day. And of course, all the incredible volunteers that are on those vessels uh, devoting their time, their energy to do, uh, to do that work. And that's really, that is really the foundation of Sea Shepherd's success is our, our volunteer base. And uh, that courage, that kind of uh, passion is what is really, really making a difference. And so I think that overall we're growing. I think the thing I'm most proud of is the fact that uh, after 45 years of these operations that we've actually created a worldwide, it's a global movement, a global movement of marine conservation. And uh, that I think is, has been a, an incredible achievement that I'm really indebted to thousands of people who have made that, made that possible mm -hmm. on ships and in support groups and oh, of course on our support base. So uh, I cause, cause for concern, but cause for optimism as well. Yes. And what I think that in addition to, you know, supporting Sea Shepherd, we can all make a difference by being cognizant of uh, what we consume, uh, where, 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 where things come from, you know, what are our actions, how they contribute to the problems that are in the ocean, how our actions can contribute to protecting uh, the oceans. And uh, one of the reasons that uh, Sea Shepherd is opposed to eating fish, for example, is because there's simply not enough fish to continue to provide, uh, you know, 8 billion people. Uh, there's also a misleading thing that we're trying to take fish away from poor peoples around the world. That's what the fishing industries would like you to believe. But our opposition has been directed against industrialized fishing operations, illegal fishing operations. And those are the operations which are impoverishing people in Africa and India and South America. And uh, so, you know, I want people to make sure to understand that, uh, you know, we're not only protecting marine resources like fish and whales and everything, but we're also protecting uh, the health and security of millions of people around the world by doing what we're doing. It's an important distinction. And along the way, I know um, <clears throat> over the decades, you've had a lot of kind of high profile supporters, but we're joined tonight, I believe, and I verified this with you earlier, the first time ever an NFL player has stepped forward, an active NFL player has stepped forward uh, to, to lend their, their voice to, to Sea Shepherd. So um, Khalid Kareem uh, is on the Cincinnati Bengals. He's uh, from Farmington, Michigan and played at Notre Dame. You caught up with him earlier. So I'd like to, to run the tape of the, 
of the interview and the time that you spent together. He's in the middle of getting his scuba license. You guys talked about his love of the oceans and some of uh, elements of of your journey. So let's go straight over to um, Paul's conversation with um, Khalid uh, Kareem of the Cincinnati Bengals. You know, so I'm happy to speak to you about that. Likewise, pleasure to be here. And uh, so, w when did you feel that you uh, that you had a concern for for the ocean and being involved with marine conservation? Um, I think my interest first sparked up when I was probably in elementary school. We would always have a side do like our favorite animals, and you know, we had to bring up topics whether they're in danger or not. And I would always pick marine life, whether it was dolphins, whales, sharks, rays. That was kind of my go-to, so I was always interested in them. But it kind of died off a little bit just because football became such a focus for me. But once I started studying at Notre Dame, I took a conservation, uh, this conservation biology class when I was there, and it was more so on the uh, was it the uh, the national park systems, which was mainly on trees. I wasn't too interested, but I started watching more documentaries online on Netflix, Hulu, all that type of good stuff. And it kind of the ball just started rolling. Wonderful. Well, you know, I, I've always felt that, you know, the culture that we live in, it's a, like a media culture, mm -hmm. that uh, when people sometimes ask me, well, what should I do if I want to protect the ocean? Should I study marine biology uh, or oceanography? And I always say, well, do what you do best. Use your abilities, your skills. And the great thing about being a football player, just like being an actor or a musician, is that puts you in a category where people listen to you. Mm -hmm. And because they listen to you, that makes you uh, potentially a great ambassador for any cause. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, ocean conservation certainly needs a, a, a lot of good ambassadors. Definitely. So I think that you can accomplish a lot just uh, as a football player, but also, of course, you'll be pursuing, uh, you know, uh, more interest in that, too, and getting involved uh, in the science, possibly, or certainly maybe activism. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, and I think that was the biggest thing with me. I, I realized, you know, the platform that I have and the amount of people that potentially will listen to me, and I just want to always, you know, create change. And one thing I, you know, told my family and friends with, you know, this whole journey I've been on lately, you know, self-identification is like, I want to leave the earth a better place than I found it. And so whether that's using my platform, you know, doing more biology, conservation, I want to be able to do that. Well, I, you know, that's the best any of us can really do is, you know, to... to make things better because we were in it and uh, you know to use our skills uh, to the best of our ability to do so and that uh, what is what is the ocean to you the ocean is a is a wonderful and mysterious place and i think that's what really got me into scuba diving um i recently been open water scuba certified since last year i wanted to do it the year before but i had a surgery on my shoulder so i couldn't do it but it's just a place i feel though you know this is Earth. Earth is home for us. And obviously, we know a lot about the land, but we don't know too much about what's underneath, you know, the water. So that's, I guess, what draws me into it so much is this mysterious, um, the mystery about it all. I always call this the planet ocean, not the planet planet Earth. But I also yeah. think there's another way of looking at it is that uh, when we think of the ocean, we think of the sea. But uh, mm -hmm. it's much more than that. It's water. It's in water and continuous circulation. Sometimes it's in the sea, sometimes in ice, sometimes underground, sometimes in the clouds, and sometimes it's in the cells of every plant and animal on the planet. So really, the ocean flows through us every day. We are the ocean, all interconnected and uh, interdependent. And uh, I, I like to get people to, to sort of understand it that way, to see that no matter where you are, you're in the ocean, you're of the ocean, you're part of the ocean. That's definitely a great way to think about it. I never really thought about it that way. So that, that's pretty cool. Is there any uh, particular, uh, you know, species or ecosystem that that, that you're uh, drawn to? I love sharks. Uh, I love sharks. I mean, I feel like they're, they're a species of animal that they have a pretty bad rep. And I, and I think that people, they're more so scared about what they don't understand. And I think that's what also draws me to, to them as well. Just, you know, wanting to, I guess give them a greater appreciation and let people know that the actual impact that they actually have on our daily lives. You take sharks out of the water, you take an apex predator out of a 
ecosystem, that whole ecosystem falls apart. If the ocean falls apart, we're eventually going to die. So I think that's kind of the message I want to get across to people that we need sharks to be around, even though we're scared of them. You know, we don't know as much as we know about, you know, a dog. We have to respect them the same way as, you know, they, they're they so important and that they're very important to our daily lives. Have you been in the water with sharks or swum with them? Unfortunately, no. Um, I went to Hawaii, swam in uh, Dove and Kona, and that was kind of, I guess, I guess disappointing to me in a way, but also kind of shocking in the sense that I went to Hawaii and I didn't see a single shark while I was there. So it was kind of alarming. And so that also kind of pushed me more to, uh, I mean, I guess, conservation. Yeah, well, there's no, there's no doubt that uh, shark populations around the world have been uh, severely uh, diminished. I mean, I think we take about 19 million of them out every year. Yeah. And, uh, you know, which is amazing when you think about it. I mean, how many people die of shark attacks every year? The average is five. Usually, yeah. they can identity. And uh, I always say it's more it's more dangerous to play golf. You know, more people die on golf courses from lightning strikes than are killed by sharks. Yeah. So there's no real rational reason to be afraid of them. To be afraid of them. I mean, I've swum with all the species, including the great white, and I uh, never felt uh, that they were a threat to me. What's your favorite? Uh, with sharks, what my favorite species is? Yeah. Uh, hammerheads. I like hammerheads. I spent, I spent a lot of time swimming with them at Cocos Island and in the Galapagos. Yeah. I find them extremely uh, fascinating. Uh, you know, yeah. the, their entire anatomy, their behavior, you know, the incredible distances that they that, that, that they travel. Mm -hmm. Cool. But there are so many species of, of sharks. Do you have a favorite? Um, I would say probably the great white or just, you know, common black tip. I love them. Right. Yeah, there's so many species. I, I had the great... Uh, opportunity to work with uh, Rob Stewart, you know, when he made sure. uh, Shark Water. And uh, I think Rob really opened up a lot of uh, people's uh, minds to uh, to looking at the sharks in a completely different uh, way. Uh, I think he influenced literally millions of people uh, through his work and, and through his, uh, his films. And uh, cool. I think I've always said that, you know, if you can do one thing in this life, if you can protect a species from extinction or save a, uh, an ecosystem from being destruction, uh, th that's probably the greatest legacy that you're you're ever going to leave. And uh, I'm really happy to see so many people, especially a lot of young people today, who are devoting themselves to making a difference in that way. For sure. Do you find that um, you know with your with your colleagues that there's uh, much interest in environmental work or conservation work? You'll see a few every now and then, I guess, you know, you know, towards conservation, but I don't, I think it's, I think as far as like marine conservation, it, it's so kind of far fetched because we're so far away from it. We're in, I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio. So I'm literally probably right smack down in the middle of the US and very far from a major body of water. So to have the mindset to, to discuss uh, conservation is kind of far fetched in a lot of ways. I think for me, um, the reason I'm so interested is just because I've been around the water a lot in my life. My family will always, you know, takes a vacation, live by a lake. So that was always an important aspect of my life. So I just want to give back in that way. So, but I think for other people, it's, it's kind of hard. Just, you know, it's not, I guess, it's a, a main concept in their lives. It's just being by a major body of water. Well, it's amazing, no, no matter where you are, that to find how many people are involved. But, you know, which state do you think has uh, the most uh, uh, divers uh, scuba divers per capita. Yeah. I mean, okay, now that you say it, I feel like it's going to be a little funky place. So probably like North Dakota, Montana, something like that. Well, it's actually Colorado. But, okay. okay. Uh, so it just shows you it doesn't matter where you are, you know, yeah. that, 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 that interest is there. What do you think are the most pressing uh, uh, threats to, to uh, marine ecosystems? Um, I think the most, th the most common thing you'll see is like, plastics, microplastics, uh, pollution like that. But it's, from the research I've been doing, it's mainly old fishing lines, um, yeah, hooks that's been thrown off uh, from fishing ships. So I think that's the biggest thing that I've seen so far. I mean, you obviously know a little bit more, so I would love to hear from you. Well, there's so many pressing problems, and that's, that's mm -hmm. those are certainly, plastic pollution is certainly one of them. Uh, my biggest concern, though, is that since 1950, there's been a 40% diminishment in phytoplankton populations in the sea. And why that's important is that uh, phytoplankton provides up to 70% of the oxygen in the air that we breathe and sequesters enormous amounts of carbon dioxide. 
And the reason for this diminishment is uh, the diminishment of seals, whales, uh, fish, seabirds, because those are the species that provide the nutrient base for the phytoplankton, the, you know, the magnesium, uh, iron, and, uh, and um, nitrogen that is required. And uh, the reason that's happening is because we're reducing fish and whale food and the seabird population so much. I mean, every day one blue whale dumps three tons of manure into the sea, which provides an incredible amount of uh, nutrients for the phytoplankton. So uh, that's one of something that not many people think about. But the, the reality is this, if phytoplankton disappears, we all die. We don't live on this planet without, without a phytoplankton. It is the foundation of all life. So that's one of the things I've been trying to get people to, uh, you know, to be aware of and to pay attention to. And, and how do you get someone interested in that? Something so small and, I guess, you know, kind of almost out of sight, out of mind, uh, I guess, people in their daily lives, how do you get them interested in that? Well, we try to focus on uh, the whales, for example, that uh, uh, refer to whales as the farmers of the ocean. They're the ones that are fertilizing the, phy uh, the phytoplankton populations. And, that. and in any uh, conservation uh, effort, you know, you, to focus on an ecosystem is very difficult. But if you can take a, uh, you know, a, a sort of like a celebrity species in a way, the jaguar in the jungle or an elephant in, in Africa, or sharks or whales, and get people to be concerned and care about that particular species and then expand that to the fact that they're dependent upon the ecosystem that they live in and how important it is to protect that that ecosystem. Sure, cool. I and mean, we take a lot of these species uh, for granted, uh, but the reality of it is, is that if without, without diversity and interdependence, um, mm -hmm. we simply could not survive ourselves because there's three basic laws of ecology, the law of diversity, the law of uh, interdependence, and the law of finite resources. And any species that doesn't live in accordance with those three laws usually goes extinct. And because uh, we steal a lot of resources from other species causing their diminishment. So I think that, uh, you know, you have to look at it really as overall, uh, how everything is connected and how everything is in, in, in independent. I've been pursuing a career in marine biology or conservation biology. I'm still trying to figure out what which path I want to take. Uh, currently, right now, I'm on board of directors over at uh, Wave Foundation with the Newport Aquarium in Newport, right. Kentucky. So I'm kind of already starting that journey now of trying to create change in young people. Uh, it's just, I guess, I know I'm on you know the right road, I guess, but I just need to, I guess, see like the Jeep. Be in the sense, just know I'm on the right track. You know, university or anything in mind? Um, no, I mean, I've been researching a few things. Uh, there's an online course I'm taking, I forget the name of it. I'm doing that right now just to, you know, broaden you know, my knowledge of you know, the ocean of marine life. But, um, I mean, I'm open to anything. What waters have you have you uh, dived in so far? Uh, I've been in the Gulf of Mexico, I've been in the Pacific, and then I've just been in uh, a quarry in uh, Florida where I got my uh, scuba diving training done at. Do you have much time, uh, you know, to, to do these, uh, do these things? Um, during the season, no, not really much at all. Um, I mean, I'm pretty much, I work almost seven days a week, so I don't have <laughs> yeah. a lot of time there. But in the off season, I'm definitely going to try to do more diving. Um, this off season, I couldn't dive again because I have another sur surgery on my shoulder, which pushed me back, so I'll be starting up diving next month. So I actually have a dive planned i think in july i'm going down to bimini bahamas there's a shark lab down there i'm going to go down with a buddy of mine his name is uh randy thomas he's a wildlife biologist field technician we actually um used to play uh football together when we were i think in like sixth or seventh grade so um we're going to go down together and you know study sharks and just you know enjoy time oh wonderful wonderful yeah so uh yeah, there's so much, uh, so many wonderful uh, dive places in the world. If you ever get a chance, you got to go to the Galapagos or to Coburn Island or those places. That uh, I've never seen so many sharks in one place as I have at uh, Cocos Island, about 300 miles off the coast of Costa Rica. Okay, cool. They sort of swim in a circle continuously around the islands. Get right in there and swim in the circle with them. Well, that'll be. Cool. Now, have you had any um, have any experience with whales or dolphins? Um I've heard them, but I haven't seen them. And I, um, as far as whales go, I've seen dolphins plenty of times, but I haven't seen um, a whale in real life, up close person. You see any opportunities where you can, uh, you know, speak on behalf of uh, of ocean life, uh, 
you know, in the capacity of what you're doing? I mean, during interviews or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I can always find a way to, you know, put those little, you know, topics in there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd love to do that. Any opportunity I can to, you know, help and support, you know, the ocean, the ocean conservation, I'd love to. Yeah, because I think you're in an ideal position to uh, reach a lot of young people with that with, with that message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the last two years, actually, in the NFL, we do, a, I think it's a My Cause, My Cleats. Um, and my past two years, the first year of my rookie year, I did uh, Ocean Conservancy. I, I partnered with them my rookie year. And then this past year, I just supported my organization, uh, the Way Foundation, we poured aquarium. So, I mean, I'm trying to do my part, and, you know, in small ways that I can, I'm just trying to make my impact felt. Well, what do you think of uh, Sea Shepherd and what we do? Oh, I, I love you guys. I've, I've been watching you guys since I was a kid. I uh, was a huge fan of Whale Wars. I mean, I don't, know, I don't know how, I guess, if you guys still partake in that kind of things, but I, I love you guys and the message you're trying to uh, get across. Well, we don't do whale wars anymore because the Japanese are no longer in the Southern Ocean. So we won that one. Yeah. Uh, so no, no, there's no need for us to be there, no need for the team. Mm -hmm. But we've been doing a lot of uh, documentaries like um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Sea Spiracy. Yeah. Uh, did you get a chance to see Sea Spiracy? Yes. Uh, uh, Chasing the Thunder. That was, that was the longest pursuit of a poacher in maritime history. It's pretty dramatic okay. uh, video if you get a chance to see it, if you haven't seen it already. Okay. But uh, you know that's really. I've always said that the most powerful uh, weapon in the world is a camera. Yeah. So that's what we really focus on trying to uh, get everything in the can and out to people so they can see, you know, see what's really going on. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I also think that uh, you know you would be uh, a great um, uh, bonus for if you did PSAs for for Sea Shepherd or any other groups really for the ocean because people will listen will listen to you and pay attention to you. And uh, I hope that going forward, we'll have the opportunity to, uh, to work with you. If you'd like to spend a couple of weeks on the ship, just let us know. Oh, I love that. Okay. Well, thank you. It's been wonderful speaking with you. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure. Cool. That was, for those of us, those of you who are just joining us, that's um, Khalid Kareem. He's the defensive end. Uh, for the Cincinnati Bengals, uh, grew up in, in Michigan, went to Notre Dame, um, but he is now officially a, a supporter of Sea Shepherd and is out there using his public profile as, a, as an active NFL player um, to help uh, raise awareness around ocean conservation issues. Um, we're going to go now to our partner in Brazil, where we have the great honor um, uh, to have Natalie Gil, the executive director of Sea Shepherd Brazil join us. And Paul, if you can come back. Um, I know Natalie's looking forward to spending um, a couple minutes with you. And then after you guys chat for a few minutes, um, we're gonna actually debut the um, 2022 Boto kind of mini documentary with English subtitles. So it'll be the first time for a lot of folks in North America that they've seen this. But Paul, you know Natalie, Natalie, you know Paul. So. Why don't you update Paul on, on Boto and things like that, and then we'll show the um, documentary. Thank you so much for this space, Roger. It's such a pleasure to be with Paul at, at a day like this, an important day like this, right, Paul? Uh, talking about this important project we're in here in Brazil. You know, yesterday I was with uh, Luis Soyos, who was the director of The Cove and Racing Extinction. So I showed him uh, the, the video of Red Journey, and. Uh, he said it was brilliantly done. So he was, uh, he said it was very well done. He was quite impressed. Yeah, it was uh, Bruna Arcangelo. She's the director on this documentary. She was on board the second expedition uh, of the Boto da Amazonia expedition. And she did a brilliant job. We have amazing media people all over the world trying to show the world what's going on with the, well, aquatic animals and also the ocean. So it's a, it's a pleasure to have them on board for sure. Yeah. And it's maybe, very, maybe go on. The most endangered species is the Paquita, but equally endangered are the river dolphins around the world, Amazonia and Irrawaddy dolphin uh, in India and there. But but uh, it's very important that we address the situation in Amazonia with the with the dolphins. Yeah, absolutely. We have at the moment all the uh, marine uh, dolphins. Sorry, all the river dolphins in the world. They are in a threat of extinction. So both the dolphins here in Brazil, the Tukushi dolphin. And the, and the Amazonian pink dolphin, as, as we normally know, but here in Brazil, we call uh, locally red dolphin. 
uh, they are both uh, threatened to extinction. River dolphins are, uh, I would say, in an even uh, worse situation because they cannot avoid the interaction with humans, right? We, they, they have nowhere to run, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, uh, this one has a bit of a, a bigger concern, as you know, Paul, as you watched in the documentary, you know the project very well. Uh, that it, it uh, the river dolphin, the pink river dolphin, has an extra challenge of being killed to be used as bait, and that's what the documentary tells a little bit about, right? Um, one, it, it, yeah. One bit of protection. Well, I, well, I was with the river dolphins well, way back in '89 in Amazon on the Amazon, and the, they do have a, a little protection from the fact that they're almost invisible because of the the brown waters of the Amazon, and you can't really see them until they surface. So that is a little protection, but I can see, you know, uh, you know, the the exploitation is relentless. Absolutely, and they, they they interact a lot with the fishermen, right? They are looking for fish in the dark. So it is inevitable that when they see a, a swell of fish, they want to get close. And of course, it, it, it gives a bit of a, a challenge uh, to interact with the fishermen. A lot, a lot of them kill the, the dolphins just to get them out of the way. But, you know, this extra kill is what's uh, a, a real danger for them, right? It's, it's killing intentionally. Uh, and, and yeah, so, so it's, it's the hard it's the hardest life they live because, uh, well, telling the story a little bit and the documentary is going to explain a little bit further, but, you know, just to give a little bit of context, this is a fish that, you know, that they kill the, the, the dolphin for bait for is a fish that is with high mercury levels. It's not consumed by Brazilians at all. So it is a fish that is actually exported. You know, it's very similar to what we know in, with the vaquita, right, Paul, that it's exported to China. In this case, it is exported to Colombia illegally as well. So it is it is a fight we need to fight. You know, those dolphins are being killed for no reason. I mean, no no uh, explainable reason whatsoever. So that's what we are here for, uh, for the long run, right? We need to, to be here on the long run as Sea Shepherd does for all the marine uh, um, animals we want to protect too. Um, yeah, shall, shall we? I don't know if you want to bring the video alive. I, I'm really excited to show the documentary to you all. It's a brilliant documentary. It's about our second, second expedition that happened in March. And the plan is for us to have two ex expeditions per year. So it is very, uh, I'm very happy to show you guys a little bit on the day to day there and the challenge we've been having with uh, the defense of the pink dolphin in Brazil. Excellent. <clears throat> Natalie, thank you so much. I know you have a lot of other interviews stacked up for tonight, so it's extremely generous of you to spend a couple minutes with us. Um, it is an so, absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we're huge fans of everything that you and your and your teams are doing. So, um, Chris, let's uh, bring up that um, let's bring up the 2022 Boto documentary. A gente está no começo da campanha, nós estamos hoje em Manacapuru. Manacapuru é uma cidade reconhecida por ser uma cidade pesqueira aqui da região né, da, da central da Bacia Amazônica. Manacapuru é onde a gente começa normalmente a história da pesquisa. Ela é uma região que teve alta concentração de pesca historicamente, principalmente de Piracatinga, e, portanto, é uma região que normalmente a gente tem muito menos concentrações e densidade de botos e tupuxis, né? a gente percebe esse contraste versus outras regiões mais protegidas. Mata bota é proibido. A mortalidade pela peste da piracatinga ela é uma, uma atividade de caça a esse animal, que é totalmente proibido. Né? E a gente tem um histórico de conflito muito grande ali naquela região. É, tanto de peste da piracatinga, que acontece... 
inclusive na última viagem, a gente chegou a ver uma atividade acontecendo ali na frente da cidade. Né? Então, é uma cidade que tem um histórico dessa pesca muito intenso, um histórico de interação com os animais, com os botos, né? de, de matança mesmo, só para não atrapalhar a atividade de pesca, também muito intensa. Então, para pescar esse peixe, estamos matando os botos. É vida. E estamos acabando com essa vida para obter outra espécie. A Sechefer é uma organização sem fins lucrativos que foca na causa marinha e nos, em todos os animais aquáticos. Ela tem, na verdade, como um foco e um diferencial a ação direta, onde o problema de fato está. Por muito tempo, a Sea Shepherd começou a prestar atenção nas espécies que estavam ameaçadas de extinção, né? Mamíferos de rio estavam muito ameaçados por causa da interação humana ser muito mais inevitável para eles. E os animais de rio do Amazonas, eles já eram até notados pelo próprio capitão Paul Watson como animais que a gente tem que olhar com cuidado. Soou alguns alertas para nós olharmos para os outros animais aquáticos que talvez estariam ainda com esperança de proteção para a gente chegar lá no momento certo. A gente pensa no rio Amazonas realmente como uma extensão do oceano, né? ele respira como o oceano. E foi quando a gente entrou em contato com a doutora Vera da Silva, né, que ela é do INPA, ela é líder, na verdade, é a pessoa que mais tem conhecimento e estudos sobre esses dois, essas duas espécies de animais, o boto da Amazônia e o tucuxi. Quando a gente perguntou para a doutora Vera o que, que esses animais mais precisam para a sua proteção e sua conservação, ela disse que são, é conhecimento, são estudos que o grande desafio que temos hoje na Amazônia em relação a pesquisas desses animais é a continuidade da pesquisa e a abrangência da pesquisa. Nós nos comprometemos né, a fazer essa parceria com o INPA como uma primeira primeiro arco de história, de tendência dessas duas populações em quatro pontos do rio. Vocês viram algum outro bicho mais próximo da... Sotália. Sim, esse é, esse é um sotalho, um tucuxi, e essa é a confirmação do ponto 129, ok? Oi, sou a Sani, Sani Bruno, eu já estou na Amazônia há 14 anos trabalhando com, com os golfinhos da Amazônia. E meu foco de pesquisa principal é justamente a ecologia populacional. Uma questão que me interessa muito é essa interação dos animais com as pessoas, né? com as atividades antrópicas, em geral. Que essas interações antrópicas elas causam um grande impacto nas popula... nos animais. né? No entanto, eu não tinha quantificado ainda exatamente que tipo de impacto, como era esse impacto, como os animais é, sentiam, digamos assim, esse impacto a nível realmente populacional. Né? Então, no meu doutorado, eu já fui trabalhar justamente com isso, com esses parâmetros populacionais, com parâmetros ecológicos da espécie para entender qual é o impacto que essas atividades têm com esses animais. Então, essa pesquisa aqui ela é justamente uma continuação. Agora a gente está contando eles por um período de tempo maior, né? a previsão é a gente fazer isso por mais ou menos três anos, seis levantamentos. A gente está fazendo uma pesquisa nas áreas é, que já se sabe que os animais usam né? aqui na Amazônia, utilizando um método onde a gente faz a contagem dos animais, avistando eles, é, estimando a distância e o ângulo. Todas as informações que vão ser planilhadas, sistematizadas, fazer uma estatística, né? Vai fazer uma estimativa de abundância e densidade. É bem difícil a gente ter os bichos aqui no, no canalzão, né? É, o comum é que estarem para dentro, assim, ali, do, mais próximos da massa. Mas, dificilmente eles ficam grudadinhos, principalmente essa massa que é barão. Mas aí é bom aqui dentro, né? aí a gente usa o binóculo também, também para ver se estão mais para fora. A gente também sempre tem duas pessoas em cada plataforma. A equipe ela é dividida em, em pro e popa, né? então a frente e trás do, do bar. Existe uma comunicação entre elas para que esses animais não sejam recontados. A gente está num período de cheio no nosso inverno amazônico. Os animais estão mais espalhados, né? A gente viu que em algumas áreas os animais são mais ativos, tem comportamentos um pouco mais de salto. Mãe com filhote, então, muito mais difícil de identificar. Se isolam mais, assim, desses grandes grupos, né? Tem que ter um foco muito grande, o olho sempre na água. 
com a Amazônia tem uma relação muito interessante com a sua biodiversidade. Né? E o Boto é uma dessas figuras icônicas, então ele tem essa importância cultural muito grande. Mas ele tem uma, uma importância ecológica e biológica imensa. Biologicamente, a gente está falando de uma unidade genética única. É uma espécie fascinante porque ela evoluiu para sobreviver dentro dos rios da Amazônia que sofrem um pulso de inundação gigantesco. E esses animais evoluíram de forma com que eles conseguem entrar dentro desses igapós porque eles são muito flexíveis. Né? Eles têm a capacidade de mover o pescoço para a direita e para a esquerda e isso facilita com que ele passe entre os troncos, as raízes das árvores e pesque entre as raízes. Tudo. Você não vai encontrar isso em outro ambiente, sabe? Nenhuma outra espécie. A gente também tem o outro golfinho, né, que é o Tucuxi, o Sotalha fluviatilis. Só o Boto e o, e o Tucuxi vivem aqui na Bacia Amazônica. Ele é de dia, 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 ele é de Supposedly, in some regions, they use the pink dolphin as bait for this catfish, uh, an alligator as well. A gente tem uma legislação específica para golfinhos para cetáceos desde 1988, e ainda assim isso não impediu que os animais é, entrassem em declínio. Como eu fiquei muito tempo aqui com os pescadores, eu consegui acessar alguns que que se disponibilizaram a contar para mim como era essa pescaria, essa atividade de pesca e essa interação de utilizar o boto como isca para pescar esse peixe. Né? Piracatinga é um peixe necrófago, não é um peixe bagre que come carcaças, vamos dizer assim, de outros animais. E esse é um peixe que é, começou a ser muito atraente na Colômbia, quando um bagre parecido na Colômbia desapareceu. Naturalmente, gerou-se essa movimentação comercial e de exportação da piracatinga. Por que, que a piracatinga é o um problema para o boto? A carne do boto é muito atraente para ela e o, o INPA percebeu isso rapidamente e fez diversos relatórios para mostrar para o governo essa preocupação e isso gerou uma moratória né, que foi aplicada em 2015, é, que é uma moratória de proibição da pesca e comércio da piracatinga no Brasil. Essa moratória ela foi temporária, ia de 2015 a 2020, convenceu-se uma extensão da moratória já duas vezes, por falta de informação de fato. A gente está aqui para estudar os botos, uma viagem se chama Expedição Boto da Amazônia. Não, o Boto que virou, virou homem, leva a mulher da gente. É a lenda, né? A história, é o mito né? que chama que ah. quando tem a festa no interior, né? o Boto se transforma num homem de branco, né? E, e é, os antigos contestam. E, e está no meio da população, né? Como um ser humano. É uma história, né? É a lenda. Eu não lembro que é contado de geração de geração. Né? A gente sempre sabe para as crianças. É que ele sobe com o chapéu, né? Tudo de branco. O boto vermelho, ele é o maior golfinho de rio do mundo. É um animal também que vive na mitologia, vive na, nos contos, nas histórias. É um animal que desde então já carrega um peso sobre ele. Eu sabia que os pescadores não gostavam dos botos, mas por quê? É uma relação conflituosa com o boto, com o tucuxi não. Eles têm até uma relação harmônica, eles gostam do, do, do tucuxi. Já com o boto a relação é bem complicada por conta é, justamente do animal estragar né, os petrechos de pesca, de, de danificar o pescado que eles estão atrás. É, a pesca na Amazônia ela é a atividade mais importante que eles têm. E também é uma atividade ancestral para eles. Assim. É bem complicado de desfazer essa trança até que a, as comunidades percebam que é um animal que é importante para eles. Estamos explorando um, um, 
peixe a partir de uma ilegalidade. E isso é grave. Se o Brasil não, não começa a proibir realmente isso e fiscalizar, certo? Existem, existem cidades no meio da Amazônia com grandes frigoríficos onde não existe nenhuma fiscalização. Certo? Não podemos estar discutindo moratórias ano a ano, é, porque sabemos que a biologia das espécies é, ocorreu a, a um tempo maior. O boto vermelho ele é um animal que tem apenas um filhote por gestação, e esse filhote ele vai ficar com a mãe em torno de 3 a 5 anos, então é um período muito longo para um mamífero, só depois desse tempo que a fêmea vai ter um novo filhote, e isso tem que ser muito levado em consideração quando a gente pensa em políticas públicas de conservação dessas espécies, porque se ela tiver em declínio, precisa de uma política que seja muito mais abrangente, porque é uma espécie que vai demorar para ter um crescimento populacional. Então, tem que ser algo sempre pensado a longo prazo. Aqui a gente está falando de espécies com algum grau de ameaça, né? O grande desafio é realmente essa comunicação entre a informação acadêmica com as políticas públicas, né? Então, não são muitas pesquisas que são focadas em ações prioritárias para o governo. A gente precisa estender essa moratória por mais tempo para conseguir entender, então, como foi esse impacto né? e manter que essas populações estejam seguras nesse tempo de coleta de dados e de análise de dados. Para falar, olha, a gente precisa parar com a peça da Precatinga. Essa situação no Rio é algo que eu falo lá. Pessoal, vamos a, a cuidar desses animais. Eles realmente contribuem como predadores topo de cadeia no ambiente eh, dos rios amazônicos. Quando tiramos predadores topo de cadeia, a cadeia trófica toda se desregula. Isso é a importância biológica, né, da biodiversidade, de perder toda uma, uma cadeia genética. Extinção realmente é para sempre. O governo federal não tem financiado pesquisas que respondam essas perguntas de uma forma mais rápida e eficiente. Então, é muito importante que organizações que tão interessados e têm interesse na conservação das espécies que participem desse processo e que tragam respostas que a gente possa utilizar para estabelecer, elaborar políticas públicas que permitam a conservação dessas espécies. Né? E que se forem retiradas ou desaparecer daqui, desaparece do mundo. A CICEPRE, como organização de, de, de conservação, está disposto a entrar na conversa para conseguir melhores informações né, para que essa moratória se mantenha no tempo com dados fidedignos. E essa é a missão da, da, da CICEPRE no Brasil. Não unicamente discutir conservação, sino discutir conservação com base científica também. Um, hats off to Sea Shepherd Brazil. Um, that's a fantastic um, piece of work. And I put it in the chat, but just so everyone knows, if you want to learn more about Sea Shepherd Brazil's campaigns, you can go to seashepherd.org.br. And uh, we, the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, partner with them on their science and on their campaigns. So when you support us at seashepherd.org. You're also helping to support the work that you just saw on uh, the Boto expedition um, that focuses on the river dolphin. Um, next, uh, we have um, the results of our junior Sea Shepherd art contest that we um, announced back at the beginning of May. In the beginning of May, we started our countdown to World Oceans Day, and we put a, we put a challenge out to junior Sea Shepherds all over the world um to help us collect some trash from their neighborhoods or off their beaches or anywhere and um as kind of an entrance fee and then also to 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 put together some drawings or some paintings or even in some cases use use the trash 
uh, to make a piece of art about their favorite marine wildlife. So um, Chris, if you'd be kind enough to pull that up, these are the, the winners of that competition. Paul's now gonna just bring us through um, the slide so we can give a quick shout out to uh, the young people who actually won uh, the contest. The, the prize is, is kind of being, uh, being celebrated here uh, with Captain Paul Watson uh, on our World Oceans Day Sea Shepherd show. And then we're also gonna be featuring some of this artwork on our social media and in our newsletters and things like that. So Captain, I give you the, the floor to, to walk us through our Junior Sea Shepherd Art Contest winners. I think it's important that the seed of conservation uh, be planted with, uh, with children. Uh, that, that was my own experience. That's how I became to do what I'm doing is because I was um, very much interested uh, when I was 10 years old. So to begin with, this is uh, Malina Clemente uh, and uh, age 12 from France and uh, her photo, her artwork of two orcas swimming and very well done. And uh, thank you, Malina. And now we have Fatima Montaserrat Samano Vega, uh, age 15 from Mexico. And this is an incredible uh, uh, drawing or a, pa a painting of, uh, of jellyfish and, and uh, manta rays. Uh, and the, the colors are, are incredible. So, so very well done. And this is uh, Benjamin. Uh, Vivian, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, age 10, from San Diego, and, and uh, pieces of trash that are collected. Uh, when, when people make artwork out of uh, trash that they collect, uh, I find is, uh, that's, that's, it's, it's really uh, shows uh, that we're connected to the problem and trying to illustrate what the problem is. And so Benjamin's done a good job here. And Hannah Bright with, uh, from Tasmania with uh, the pieces of trash that she's turned into into a turtle and a uh, greenback turtle. Well done. Age seven. <laughs> Asia Krokove, age six, uh, from Budapest. And uh, she has 27 pieces of trash collected to turn into this loggerhead sea turtle work of art here. Well done, that is. And Zorad Krokove, uh, age nine, again from Hungary, with 45 pieces of uh, trash collected. And this is her artwork of the Pekita Totoaba. Uh, and uh, the colors here are, are incredible. It's, I like the sun on, on there. It's almost a very, uh, uh, well, it's hard to say, but it, like uh, Van Gogh-ish. <laughs> well done. Pablo Colron, age six, uh, 500 pieces of trash collected. And uh, he's uh, Tortuga Marina, the turtles that he, he put together made out of those pieces of trash, an uh, incredible piece. Emilio Sambache Pen Penaloza, uh, age four, a thousand bottle caps, it looks like. And uh, he's turned them into a whale. I can't, at age four, he's done that. That's incredible. Maria Paredes, age six, 300 pieces of trash collected. And uh, again, a whale in a very, very colorful display of, uh, being shown by all these children. Sofia Escobar, Tayo Panta, age five, 300 to 400 pieces of trash collected. And uh, with the, the Medusa and the turtles and marina turtles, and uh, this, uh, the colors here are, are incredible too. The starfish, love it. Julian Banavides Bolanos, age four, 350 pieces of trash collected and turned into this uh, sea turtle. And uh, I think there's an octopus in there in purple. It's uh, a beautiful piece. Eston McDonald from Florida, 39 pieces of trash collected and turned into an octopus uh, on the beach. Well done. Amaja Kerstin, age 12 from Belgium, 25 pieces of trash collected and her artwork of a sea turtle, a dolphin, octopus, uh, and the message that it's conveying is very well done. And Anthony Giaffo, age seven from Pasadena, 10 
plus pieces of trash collected and his depiction of orca, octopus, and fish. Ada Kerstin, age nine from Belgium and 54 pieces of trash collected. And while wow, that's quite a unique uh, octopus, love this one. Ayana Yayan, age seven from Dubai, 10 pieces of trash collected. Uh, and her depiction of a narwhal, which is actually quite unique. It's uh, like actually, uh, it's almost like a, a movie uh, anime character, I think. <laughs> Korea, Cora X, age seven from Illinois, 47 pieces of trash collected and the depiction of a jellyfish and uh, abstract, but it's there. <laughs> Lake and Arnold, age 16 from Oklahoma, 10 pieces of trash collected. And this is his uh, vessel, his ship with the humpback whale. Uh, and uh, that's actually Sea Shepherd uh, logo right there, jumping out of the water at that thing and well done. So congratulations to all the junior Sea Shepherds and uh, everybody could join us and congratulate our 2022 Junior Sea Shepherd Art Contest winners and look for their images on our social media and use throughout the year to help us to get more people involved in ocean conservation. Combined, the winners picked up more than 3,000 pieces of trash from the beaches and helped clean those beaches and their, and their neighborhoods. Made a significant difference. Awesome. Thank you, Captain, for giving all of those young people a, a shout out. I, I, I think you've just made some young folks really happy all, across, all over the world. Uh, um, sticking with our next generation of, uh, of conservationists, um, Kim Diaz is going to join us. Um, Kim comes on virtually every program, and she's always kind enough to uh, get some questions from uh, some of her student, students, some of the students of, uh, of different uh, volunteers of ours across the chapter. So Kim, uh, you're on with Captain Watson and um, you have some students uh, questions. So let's hear them. Okay, so Captain, I did not, I did not um, edit these questions at all. So you're gonna hear them exactly how the children asked. We're gonna start with um, the first one is, um, do you get sick do you get sick on the ships? Well, I've never been seasick, but a lot of people are. But I, fortunately, I never have been seasick. Yeah. He, he made me aware that his father does. <laughs> um, another question came from eight-year-old Grant. Um, he wants to know, what is your favorite ship? Well, that would have to be the Steve Irwin, because that's the vessel that I served on the longest as captain down in the Southern Ocean. So. I have a personal bias for that vessel. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, Nine-year-old Matthias wants to know, um, do you like exploring? Well, yes, I do. I like exploring, uh, you know, and I think that uh, that's one of the benefits of doing the conservation work over the years is to, to explore places like the Southern Ocean, uh, Antarctica, the uh, South Pacific, uh, the Mediterranean, all over where we've been. It's always, it's always fascinating to go to these places and, and experience uh, what's there and to, to learn so much about the, those particular ecosystems. Okay. Um, I had another student ask, how many miles have you traveled? <laughs> that I have absolutely no idea. On a typical campaign down to the Southern Ocean, uh, the ships would probably cover anywhere from 11 to 15,000 kilometers uh, uh, during that trip. So I, I, I guess overall, over all the years, would, the, the, the miles would be in the millions. Millions, okay. Um, what makes you do what makes you do what you do? <laughs> uh, the realization that uh, if we don't stop the uh, destruction in marine ecosystems, that um, life in the ocean will die. And if life in the ocean dies, we're going to die. So it's really a question of survival for, for all of us, each and every one of us. Thank you. Um, what is your favorite marine animal? I actually don't have a favorite marine animal because I think that they're all equally important. So I, I've never really decided on a favorite, really. Uh, you know, I like, I, I like the everything from the phytoplankton to the, the great whales. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, um, well, of course, uh, this one particular child, I explained that you already, you, you do have two boys, two boys and a daughter. 
Um, he asked if, do you want your children to become captains? <laughs> well, that's up to them. You know, I think that every child has to make their own decisions on that. Uh, my daughter has crewed on the ship. Uh, and uh, if my sons wish to do so, they, that would be wonderful. But again, every, you know, every child has to decide what their, where their life is, what is going to be about, what their passions are and what they want to pursue. Okay, we know Tiger with chess. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, and Hot Wheels. <laughs> and Hot Wheels. Um, what is the most unusual animal you've ever seen? Oh, gee, the most, well, I would have to say the most unusual animal I've ever seen is probably the platypus, which is, uh, you know, uh, is the one of the old, very, very few uh, marine, uh, very few, few mammals that actually lays eggs and it's one of the only animals that has a po has a poison claw and it has a a duck's beak and a beaver's tail so you know it's pretty pretty unusual <laughs> yeah the platypus yeah i would say so um i i don't think i've ever seen one live i've only seen them in books or on a television show or something oh, um yeah actually isn't it? And then um, I had a seven-year-old ask, how big is the ocean? <laughs> well, the, uh, I would answer that by saying, how big is the ocean? It's the entire planet. The entire planet is the ocean. So the, and the ocean is all of us. So it's as big as the, <laughs> as the entire globe. <laughs> big as the entire globe. And I had another question and I'm, I, I think I understand it. How much land has the ocean taken over? I think, well, I think what he's referring to there is a rising sea levels, yeah. and uh, th there's is definitely a reality that, uh, especially in the South Pacific, where where islands which have got, are very just above sea level already, and they're having real problems with uh, sea levels rising, and of course that's covering up the land. Uh, so this is going to be an ongoing problem through the 21st century of um, uh, of rising sea levels taking over land. Okay, um, I think. That, I think that was it. I'm just, I think that was it as far as the children's questions went. I do have another one. What was your most memorable moment at sea? Oh, well, there's been so many moments. I can't really say there's a more memorable <laughs> than that i think uh the best experiences of you know being in the southern ocean being along uh, the uh, amongst the icebergs and the penguins and the and the whales of antarctica would be the, the most memorable things thank you thank you for answering their questions kim thank you so much um captain you've been so kind to join us for an hour i'm going to uh let everyone know our, our next sea shepherd show will be on wednesday july 13th but i'll i'll hand uh I'll hand the reins over to you for any kind of closing thoughts that you might have for our, our family of supporters. And, and thank you so much for um, spending the hour with us. Well, thank you to everybody for spending the hour with us. And, uh, uh, and thank you for your support for Sea Shepherd. And, uh, and if you can renew your uh, support with a gift or as a member of Monthly Direct Action Crew, uh, that would be very helpful in supporting our crews and our ships uh, at sea. And uh, also thanks to a matching uh, challenge grant provided by the Ruth Stanton Foundation and the William G. Bannerman Foundation means that all donations will be doubled up to $120,000. So you can click the link in the chat or visit our website online, seashepherd.org. Uh, and the captains, the crews, and the staff, and the volunteers of Sea Shepherd, thank you for continuing to champion our work for the ocean. And join us Wednesday, July 13th for episode 10 of the Sea Shepherd Show. And you can always go to seashepherd.org for updates on our campaigns. Thank you. And thank you for everything that you do for the oceans and for your support.